Good evening. I'm Bob Becker, director of the Strom Thurmond Institute, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to, to this evening's program. Wow, what a wonderful crowd. I'm glad you're all here. I think you're in for an exciting evening. The Calhoun Lecture Series is a special program at Clemson because it's provided by folks from around Clemson who believe in bringing exciting speakers and discussions to the campus. Uh, it's funded by private donations from the Calhoun Patrons uh, uh, Council and the Calhoun Patrons. And I'd like you to give them a round of thanks for their over decade support for this program. Now, for over 10 years, the program has brought noted speakers from around the world to Clemson. And this year, we sat back as we were planning our program and thought, you know, when you're at a great university, often you don't see what's right before your eyes. It's kind of like the old saw that the expert's someone from 100 miles away who comes to town. But this year, we decided to focus on Clemson, that one of the lectures each year is going to now feature someone who has been outstanding at Clemson University. And uh, this is going to be an exciting kickoff for what we think will be a long tradition of bringing the best of Clemson to the best of Clemson. So we're, we're delighted with this our opening. As is typical uh, with the Calhoun Lecture Series, we have a panel discussion that will follow uh, the presentation from Patrick McMillan. And our speakers uh, joining, and the panelists joining uh, Patrick will be Steve Johnson. And Steve is a member of the, South, of the Clemson University Library. He is very active in envi community environmental activities. He served on the Beautification and Environmental Advisory Committee for Pickens County, and he's chair of the City of Clemson's Green Ribbon uh, Committee. So Steve, welcome and thank you for participating this evening. Pat Sangoli is a professor in entomology at Clemson University. She, she's been involved with the extension and the research urban entomology program. So if Patrick strays into bugs, she'll know all about it. So uh, Pat, thank you very much for being with us this evening. Now I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Hap Wheeler. And Hap is the, uh, actually he's Patrick's boss. He's the chairman of the biological science program at Clemson. He holds the class of 39 excellence award and he's going to provide a fitting introduction for Patrick McMillan. So please welcome Hap Wheeler. Expeditions with Patrick McMillan. This is more than a title of his award-winning television series. This title describes his life. His search and discovery of the natural world has taken him to the three corners of South Carolina and the four corners of the world, from Africa to Southeast Asia, from the Arctic Circle to the tip of South America, from the frozen north to the tropics and the great deserts. Many of you here tonight know exactly what I'm talking about because Patrick has led a nature walk, given a talk, or led a workshop for a group in which you are involved. In fact, the last time I counted, he had given well over 200 public presentations and led well over 100 field trips. For his TV show, he is the master of all trades as creator, writer, host, and contributing videographer. As a testament to his skill, this series is being honored with three Telly Awards, a Media Achievement Award, and two Millennium Awards. Because of these activities, and many more too numerous to mention, Patrick McMillan has become a household name synonymous with natural science. My perspective on Patrick is different from most as his principal duties for the Department of Biological Sciences are as scholar, teacher, and director of the Campbell Museum of Natural History. Patrick is an irreplaceable part of our teaching program at Clemson. It is an understatement to say that he inspires students' interest in plants. In fact, students make a point of stopping by my office to tell me how much he makes plant biology interesting. And believe me, to hear this from pre-medical students, normally pretty hard sells when it comes to botany, suggests to me that he's truly an inspirational teacher. In fact, we've had several undergraduates who had been converted to plant biology because of his mentorship. 
Under his leadership, the museum's plant collection has grown to be the largest in the state and is a significant teaching and research asset for the campus. Remarkably, Patrick has identified any number of locally rare species not previously thought to be native to this region, and in fact, he has discovered several new species. Now, given the number of naturalists who have scoured this region for hundreds of years, this suggests how thorough he is and what a keen eye he has. Patrick also maintains an active research program. He has authored or co-authored numerous scientific, popular, and technical publications. One of the technical publications Patrick co-authored won a National Conservation Award. One of his conservation projects reestablished a rare population of pitcher plants in the upstate, which had been nearly wiped out by collectors. Perhaps the best way I can describe Patrick's level of activity is through what has become an all too typical day for him, one that I was able to observe recently. He started by giving a talk and leading a field trip for a group in Greenville. Following that, he had to hurry back to Clemson in order to teach a field lab in plant taxonomy. As soon as the lab was finished, he hosted a special nature trip for my Dixon Fellows group. He was a guest speaker for dinner somewhere else that night, and when I returned later that evening, he was hard at work at a project in the museum. Now, we often talk about sacrifice in describing people's dedication to their work. In Patrick's case, this can be interpreted quite literally. In the line of duty, he has been bitten repeatedly by snakes and an alligator, chased by bears and swarmed by insects. He has fallen from a bridge and down a waterfall. He has been hospitalized from heat stroke. He has suffered bouts of several infectious diseases and has been threatened and verbally abused by individuals who are unsympathetic to his conservation messages. However, undaunted, Patrick continues to work harder and more effectively than any other person I can remember. He is talented beyond measure and universally respected. It has been said by many, both at Clemson and elsewhere in the region, that he is one of the best natural historians, conservation biologists, and field botanists they have known. I swear, you could drop Patrick down anywhere on the planet, and he could identify and tell you a story about every organism visible to the naked eye. It is great people that make universities great. You would expect to find a worker as good as Patrick at the best of universities, and I feel that we are most fortunate that he is here to help us join that elite group. And apropos of his talk tonight, he practices what he preaches. He is, without doubt, the ultimate communicator of our natural world. Patrick. What an introduction. I don't <laughs> How do you live up to that? Uh, I'll try. Thank you very much, App. Um, I want to first start out by uh, thanking the um, Calhoun Lecture patrons for inviting me here tonight. And um, as I expressed to them earlier, I've talked a lot of places and a lot of times, and I'm honored every time anybody asks me to talk, whether it's a garden club in the Native Plant Society, anybody that I can talk to. I go out and I talk to them because I'm passionate about what I do. I love this world, and I love the things that are in it, and I love the, the interconnections that we see there, but I've never been so honored as when they asked me to speak here at Clemson at uh, the Calhoun Lecture Series. So it truly is my honor to speak to you tonight, and I hope that this is the beginning of a, of a long tradition of inviting some of the fantastic scholars that we have here at Clemson to the Calhoun Lecture. And we have a lot of them, and there's a reason Hap, that I am at this university, and not only is it situated in one of the best places in the world, if you like plants, it's great. I can go to the coast in a few hours. I can go to the mountains in less than an hour. It's a perfect place to live for me. But it's also surrounded with a climate of people that are beyond compare. It's one of the best places in the world to work, and it's one of the best places in the world to live. So without further ado, what I would like to speak to you on tonight is entitled uh, Failure to Communicate. And what we have here is <laughs> a failure to communicate. Um, our country right now is in some pretty, pretty big trouble. We're, we're at war. 
Um, literally, we're at war. And I think also, we are definitely a country that is at war ideologically. In our country, we bicker today and make a point of bickering, make careers out of bickering today over matters that aren't really important, and we miss what's important about those disciplines and those matters in the meantime. And in the scientific world, it's no different. We bicker among ourselves, but also there's divisiveness between the scientific community and the general public. And that's part of what I'd like to talk to you about tonight. It's not a Republican or Democrat thing, but it really came home to me um, when I was watching the presidential debates. And this guy came up. Very first presidential debate. I'm very worried today because I feel like science is becoming a dirty word. Why is it that at all three presidential debates, something that had to do either with scientific research or science education came up as a waste of money? When did science become a waste of money? What do we wear on our backs, eat when we <laughs> sit down at the table, drive in when we go to the grocery store? What we're using in this world came from science, and especially environmental science. That seems to be a divisive factor. If we're looking for some way that the government is wasting money, we look to my friend the grizzly bear here. And I brought up the grizzly bear, and I thought about this talk, and I actually came up with this talk. During that debate, I said, I got to do a talk about grizzly bears. Not only that, I got to do a show on grizzly bears, because people are missing the point here. It may actually be important to understand the genetic structure of grizzly bears. Well, let me show you just a few slides. And I'm not going to say much. I'm just going to show you a few slides, images. And I just want you to think about what you think about, and not what you just, th just what you think about, but what you feel when you see these images. Darwin, California is a ghost town. Maybe prophetic, I don't know. But Darwin, California is a ghost town. Uh, it's in Death Valley National Park in, near Panamint Springs uh, in the Panamint Valley, one of the hottest, most horrible dry places on Earth. But you know, when you see that, Anywhere in this country, that name and the concepts that that embodies um, create tension, create divisiveness. And we tend to look at this as a all or none issue on both sides. And that's really part of the problem with communicating is that scientists can be fantastic researchers, but we write for other scientists and we communicate to other scientists and we don't communicate the value of the work that we're doing and the importance of the work that's being done at universities like Clemson, back out to you. I could care less about communicating to scientists. Maybe that's why I make a terrible scientist. But I love communicating with you because you guys are the ones, the ones who aren't scientists that are out there, <laughs> and the scientists too. You, we, we count as citizens as well. But we're the ones that really make the policy decisions really drive where this world is headed. I could know more about climate change than any other person on the face of the earth and be the one person who really knows what causes it, but I'm not the one who's going to make the policy. Polar bears. Maybe I should have put Leonardo DiCaprio up beside it. <laughs> who hasn't seen the polar bear commercial on television? Right? It's everywhere. Um, I don't hate the polar bear, but you know, when you see the polar bear now, you think about, geez, here's another one of those whack job tree hugger commercials trying to get me to feel sorry for something that looks cute, but will eat me if he finds me on an ice floe. And realistically, I mean, polar bears, yeah, how often do you see a polar bear in your backyard? You know, how is that affecting my life, a polar bear? Who cares about the polar bear? Well, maybe we should, but to me, that, <laughs> I hate that polar bear commercial. I really, honest to God, I hate it. Tell me something that really will affect people's life that, will, that they'll care about. Well, it, we're at war with other things in the United States, too, uh, including any ideology, but also, what about obesity? What about losing our connection and our understanding of the world? The world we live in. When I grew up, and for most of us in here are over, let's say, 40. <laughs> when we were growing up, um, our day, when we got home from school, you hid out to the woods, or the treehouse, or the sandbox. 
You lived in a city, you went to the park. You went outside, you were outside, you were experiencing the world, you were understanding it. You can't teach people that. That cannot be taught. And we're raising generation after generation of kids now without them experiencing, not just reading about it, not seeing it on television, you know? Not watching it on the computer, experiencing it. That's how you learn. That's how you get connected to the world. I don't think there's any way to teach somebody to do what I do in the woods. I don't do a lot of things good, but I, when I go out in the woods, I can tell you when I walk into woods anywhere where the painted trillium is going to be before I even go to look for it. Because I knew it when I was growing up. I felt it. I knew what it did. I knew where it liked to grow. You can't teach people that. Especially you can't teach grown-ups that. I try all the time. You just can't teach them. Um, we got to get our kids back outside. And a lot of people view the world in an interesting way. In Western civilization, I think we view the world very interestingly. Um, if you leave places where Western civilization and Americanism has happened, and you ask them, hey, I want to go out and I want to see nature, they'll look at you and they'll go, coma? What? Nature? There are many cultures in this world that don't have a word for nature, by the way. And I wish we didn't have a word for nature. It is the world. And human beings, last time I checked, were the largest force working on the world, right? We are a big part of nature. You can be here in Times Square, like my son is. Um, he was on the Today Show that day, actually. We weren't featured. We were outside on the day when it was four below zero, and we were the only two people who were brave enough to stand out there, and the weatherman came out and talked to us. But, um, you know, even here, even in New York City, that's still the natural world. It's still the world because humans did that. And humans did that with things in nature, and humans are part of nature. Right? So even there, there's lots of wildlife, bed bugs, even fancy hotels I find out in, in New York City have bed bugs, cockroaches, peregrine falcons, doves, pigeons, uh, lots of wildlife in New York City. And, you know, the, the, the way things really are, it doesn't just happen, here again is my son, in the Great Smoky Mountains. It doesn't just happen here. We're connected everywhere we are. We're a big part of nature. In fact, we're the largest part of nature. But the most important part to me is how can we understand and care for it if we don't experience it? That's my goal. That's my goal. In doing what I do, I want to teach people and excite them about the places I go, the things I see. But I want more than that. I don't want you just to watch expeditions, although I would really appreciate it. <laughs> but <clears throat> I want you to get out and I want you to experience it. Enough of that. Let's leave that alone and let's go out and go on an expedition. Um, I'd like to take you to British Columbia. Okay? First, it seems to be, eh, it's a long ways away from South Carolina. What in the world could British Columbia have to do with life in South Carolina? The farthest reaches of the world have to do with life in, in South Carolina. And I think we're going to explore that right now. British Columbia is an absolutely amazing place. When I was a little kid, I was a strange little kid, and my grandmother, who really inspired me to become a naturalist, she used to read me books you know, on animals and plants, and she always read me the scientific name. That's why I turned out so weird. But um, she had travel books. And I picked out the one place in the world I wanted to be more than any other. And it was Tweedsmuir National Park, which is located right about in here in British Columbia. And this past year, first time in my life, I was able to go out, not just to, to that area, but to experience a big chunk of one of the largest wilderness areas left on Earth and the largest piece of temperate rainforest left on this planet, the Great Bear Rainforest, one of the just unbelievably still just so wild, still working, still functioning as a complete ecosystem, and also a site where a lot of disparate organizations came together to preserve this place. There's five million acres now there that are off limits to logging, and the other 19 million that make up the Great Bear Rainforest are under an ecosystem-based management. So this is a place where mining companies, lots of people came together, worked together to achieve a solution. Well, I always wanted to see a whale, come on. Especially humpback whales, big baleen whale. But this is advertised as me trying to tell you a story that you'll believe somehow that when whales die, trees grow slower in the forest. I can't tell you what it's like to go out across Fitz Fitzhugh Sound and see whales jumping all around you. They feed filter feeders, right? Baleen, they strain small organisms out of the water. And when they're done feeding, they feed cooperatively. And they, they advertise the fact they're feeding. But when they're done feeding, they play. 
and we're not sure why they play. But sometimes they'll come breaching right up out of the water, and listen to this. It sounds like a gun going off. Unbelievable, 30 tons of humpback whale catapulting itself out of the water, smashing back down on the surface, and we think that's probably to advertise to all the other humpback whales that we've finished eating, there's no more food left, no reason to come to the barbecue joint. Find your food <laughs> elsewhere. Amazing animals, these humpback whales, and an animal that everybody knows uh, suffered greatly during the 1800s and 1900s, up to about the middle of the 20th century. Uh, whales were really just being ruthlessly slaughtered um, for their products, important products. And part of the reason we've done so well is because of what whales were able to donate to us. In British Columbia alone, about 24,000, a little over 24,000 whales uh, were recorded. Now, didn't record every whale, but uh, the five land-based operations, 24,000 whales uh, were collected. And of those, 10,431 were humpbacks. A lot more than that was taken from offshore British Columbia waters, even inshore waters. And that's because these uh, major commercial whalers, as of or the early 1900s, were processing whales on the boat, not on land. So lots of whales disappeared. So many so that the North Pacific population of humpback whales was down to below 1,500 whales from a population that may have been up about 50, 100,000 before whaling. So major, major impact on whales. Um, today, there's 18 to 20,000 of these things in British Columbia. Again, it's a success story. Um, but what did that do? What happens when you pull a whale out of the ocean, stick it on a beach and flush it? <laughs> what are you doing to the environment? A whale's a big thing. The ripple effects of removing just one whale will remove up to four tons of food that would have been collected out of that system. Four tons of things like copepods and euphosia uh, krill um, out of the system, and also herring, because uh, these North Pacific humpbacks also eat herring. So a huge amount of food all of a sudden is not being consumed. And how many fish does it take to replace one 30-ton whale? We would have never known the story that I'm going to tell you today if it hadn't have been for things like this. Not many people care about octopus squid, kelp, but look how cute that thing is. <laughs> Northern fur seal, look at that. Who doesn't like that? Northern fur seal, and you know, they're so cute, and you guys all know the nice little voice they have. Let's see if we can jack up the sound on this thing, hear the voice real well. <laughs> Ain't that cute. <laughs> the Northern fur seal is a species uh, which today is only really breeding at, in the northern part of the Pacific on the uh, Pribilof Islands, and the populations are plummeting. But this species, uh, the largest of all the sea lions, and you can hear them roaring in that audio back there, this is the stellar sea lion, or the northern sea lion. This is truly a gigantic seal. This thing can get 10 foot 6 inches long and weigh in at about 2,300 pounds. That's twice the size of any grizzly bear that lives in the Great Bear Rainforest ecosystem. And this seal itself uh, has suffered one of the greatest declines of any species in the North Pacific waters. Um, today, it's extraordinarily rare. Uh, there are two populations. We divide them in two populations. Uh, one that we call the Western population that's mostly found in uh, the Aleutian Islands, uh, Bristol Bay, Prince William Sound, the western part of Alaska. And that population in the 1970s consisted of about a quarter of a million seals. Incredible number. By the 1990s, by 1997, there are only about 40,000 left. Many populations of the seal dropped more than 90% in 20 years. And it looked like we were going to lose stellar sea lions altogether. The eastern population, which is much wider distributed, has always been much smaller, around 45,000 animals back in the 70s and around 45,000 today. Um, they're holding their own, but they're not increasing. So these animals are in trouble. But when something as cute as a sea lion dies, you get lots of money to study and find out why, and you generally find a lot of different answers to the same question, and we never really know which one's right. But we got this one totally wrong. It's an example of how science works. They're hypotheses. And sometimes they're right, sometimes they're wrong, sometimes we think they're right, and they turn out to be wrong. Um, turns out with the stellar sea lion that the closer the population is to Prince William Sound, the more distressed it is. Well, there's a good reason for this. In 1989, 
uh, March 24th of 1989, a big catastrophe happened. And I think all of us who are my age or younger at that time really remember that date because the Exxon Valdez spilling that oil out into Prince William Sound was one of the biggest ecological catastrophes that's ever happened. But it was rather localized. It was big, but it wasn't everywhere the sea lion lives. But the closer a population was to Prince William Sound, the closer it is to Prince William Sound today, the worse off it's doing. Some people propose that as the reason. The other reason they thought was, well, when we find dead sea lions, what's in their stomach? What are they eating? And when we found dead adult sea lions, you know what we found in their stomach? Pollock, walleye pollock, a nice big cod-like fish that lives in deep water in the Pacific. It's a predator. And that's what we were finding. We knew sea lions dive pretty deep, the adults. So we figured, well, the pollock must be the cause for the problem. Pollock must be declining. We better shut down the pollock industry, the pollock fishing around sea lion colonies. Maybe that'll solve the problem if we do that. Well, we did that. In fact, today, the sea lion colonies, there's still no pollock fishing in any kind of vicinity to where sea lions are living and breeding. The problem with that is that we found out that sea lions only eat pollock because they can't get herring. Just a couple years ago, we got uh, sort of wind of this. What happens with sea lions is that the adults can dive deep. They can get to those harder to reach fish, but all fish aren't created equal. The young sea lions, they like to eat herring, and there's more than one reason. The adults would rather eat herring too, but they can get to those other fish types. The, the young sea lions can't dive as well their first winter. And winter in Alaska, if you've been there in the winter, you need a lot of fat to get through the winter in Alaska. It's pretty depressing. You think it's depressing here in the wintertime. Imagine the sun doesn't come up, right? So herring school in very dense colonies, and they school close to the surface inshore and close to the surface in the wintertime, making them available to young sea lions. And the pollock, deep water, out at sea. And there's another big difference. The herring, just like sardines, full of oils, full of fat, Great food to get a hold of if you want to build fat reserves to make it through the winter. So a big part of what's going on here is just like every environmental question that we have today, it's not any one thing. We have herring that are in trouble. And the herring are in trouble for an interesting reason. Number one, the Exxon Valdez. That's no coincidence. March is the breeding season for herring. So that happened at the worst time of the year. And the herring still haven't recovered in Prince William Sound. But we fish for herring. And we fish herring for just a few minutes a year. It's an amazing thing to see when they're breeding. They open up the season, and all these trawlers haul their lines out. And in about an hour's time, they may make eight, nine, ten million dollars collecting herring. Um, harvest pressure could be part of it, but an upset in the balance of the ocean that was largely driven by the loss of whales and a warming and a change in the North Pacific waters, a rise of four degrees Celsius in the North Pacific waters in some areas that was due in part to what they call the decadal oscillation of the Pacific, uh, the El Nino event, the La Nina events, and the decadal oscillation in the North Pacific and possibly also a warming that we've seen worldwide. Uh, increasing that, have all worked to, to harm the herring population. And that's really what's going on with these sea lions. It's an amazing story. Doesn't have much to do with the tree, though, does it? Well, more than seals seed herring. Salmon eat herring, too. Now, do you all know the story of salmon? Most people do. Five species of salmon in the genus Oncorhynchus out in the west coast. And those salmon come from the sea up the rivers, they do what those sockeye salmon just did, what those chum salmon are doing there. They lay eggs, and then what do they do? They die. This is an amazing thing to see. Uh, millions and millions of salmon clogging just one small coastal stream in British Columbia. They're important to us, <laughs> and they're important to the environment. Um, and the story of salmon is just, it's an incredible one. But that, the dead salmon, are just as important as the living salmon. Salmon find their way. I meant to stop that while the thing was still on the live salmon, so you didn't have to look at that awful dead thing. <laughs> Sorry. Um, salmon find these streams in an amazing way. It's a good example of how science can tell us some really neat things about fish. Who knew that fish had built-in magnetic compasses? Isn't that crazy? These fish may be over off of Japan, or Sakhalin Island, or Kamchatka, over in the USSR. And it comes time for them to spawn, and all of a sudden they turn, and they swim, not erratically, in a straight line, exactly to where they want to go. 
We believe that salmon have a way to sense the geomagnetic field of the Earth and know approximately where they're at, similar to the way sea turtles do it, and make their way back to the general area where they were born. And the neat thing about salmon is that they have what we call in science natal fidelity. That means you want to go back to the place you were born to breed. Okay? So they find the stream that the egg was laid in that they came from through a geomagnetic compass and gets them to the region, but then they start swimming into the estuaries of each one of the streams as they dump out in the ocean, <laughs> smelling. They use scent. These animals were shown to imprint on the scent of their native stream in order to find a way back. We've shown that experimentally because we took PEA, ethyl alcohol, and put it in with some fish eggs in a hatchery in the Columbia River system, raised them up in that hatchery, released them at sea, and then started to dump PEA, that's an ethyl alcohol type thing, ethylene, and we dumped it into a stream that wasn't the stream they were born in. Where do you think they showed up? The stream we were dumping the PEA in. Pretty cool. They used their nose to find the stream that they come back to. And they, when they come upriver and die, do something else that's absolutely incredible. The act of them dying is more important to me than the act of them living. This is going to sound crazy for a minute, but coastal streams in the Great Bear Rainforest, we have all this rain. They're what we call ultra-oligotrophic. It's another fancy scientific word, but all that means is that they don't have many nutrients. And you can't grow algae, and you can't grow food, and you can't grow things without nutrients. The forest isn't going to give them nutrients. The things that live in that stream aren't going to give it nutrients. But when you can take a fish that leaves these streams as a little fry, goes out to sea and puts on 99% of its bulk at sea, marine-derived nitrogen, marine-derived phosphorus, brings that nitrogen and phosphorus back into the stream that it was born in and then dies, it's donating marine-derived nutrients to a freshwater system. Pretty cool. When you have a salmon that dies in the stream, the body of that salmon, and that, that's a pretty big salmon, that's a Chinook salmon, we call them Thais when they're over 30 pounds. It donates the nitrogen that grows that algae. And that algae, the biofilm, is what feeds the small vertebr invertebrates. And the small invertebrates feed, guess what? Fish. They don't feed just any fish, they feed the young Chinook salmon. Without the dead bodies, the dead rotting bodies of all those salmon in the stream, you couldn't produce the next generation of salmon that are going to use that stream. That's pretty fantastic. Every living thing in that stream depends on a flush of, of nitrogen that's coming from the ocean. It's being brought there by salmon. How important is that in British Columbia? 20% of all the world's salmon use the streams in British Columbia to breed. That's pretty important. 3,000 genetically distinct races of salmon are found in British Columbia. 3,000 different races, each one of them genetically distinct. This is important because you see all these little yellow squiggly lines here on the coast? It's a rainforest, remember? There's lots of water, so there's lots of streams. It was glaciated, too, so most of those streams were just straight little streams. Well, each one of those streams, from all the way up here in northern Alaska all the way down to California, is very different. It has different water chemistry. It has different water temperature. If it comes out of a glacier, it's got a lot more silt. If it's way up in Alaska, it's a lot colder. And the neat thing about salmon is that the stream conditions themselves have selected each race of salmon to come upstream at a different time of the year to spawn. So salmon up in Alaska may spawn six months later than salmon in, in uh, California because you want those eggs to hatch at just the right time so that the babies can get out to sea at the correct time of year. And salmon eggs don't just take nine or 10 or 19 days to, to hatch. They hatch depending on the thermal units they get. The number of hours at a certain degree temperature that those eggs are subjected to is how long it takes them to hatch. So cold water, it takes longer. So if you have a shorter growing season and colder water, you have to lay your eggs earlier to make sure that those young salmon are capable of getting out to sea at the right time. Each salmon will only go back to its natal stream mostly. Some salmon stray. But mostly, each one of those streams is unique genetically. And when we lose one stream in British Columbia, just salmon from one stream, we may never be able to get those salmon back because that race will be lost forever. It's an amazing example of natural selection working on each salmon race up there in British Columbia. So that's what's so cool. It's all inspiring Okay, I'm about to do something that's never been done in a Calhoun lecture before. I promise you. 
the nutrients that come from the sea that are deposited in those streams that grow the salmon don't stay in the stream. Not just in the stream. They drive the ecology of this entire forest. Nitrogen from the sea comes in a special form that can only be gained at sea. It's called an isotope, nitrogen 15. And we find it from the bottom, from the stream side, all the way to the peaks of the mountains and every living thing that we look at in the Great Bear Rainforest. So I'm going to show you how it gets there. If you're really squeamish and sensitive and don't like kind of gross things, I'll tell you when to turn your eyes. This forest up here is an amazing place to go visit. 200 foot tall trees. It's an incredible forest. Sitka spruce, western hemlock, western red cedars, incredible things. How does the salmon get into the forest? Well, eagles, right? And of course, our old friend the grizzly bear that nobody cares about. Turns out the bear is a keystone in the system. Just like the salmon, it's a keystone of the system. The bear is one of the most important means for that salmon getting out of the stream. I always thought they were really skilled hunters. When you go and see them, they just plop down on the salmon. Uh, and they, there's just so many salmon that they can be really clumsy and still catch fish. And they better be pretty good at it because, and this is where it starts to get gross, so. Uh, they better be pretty good at it because they have to gain 400 pounds to survive the winter. Uh, doubling their weight. And bears are messy eaters. Generally, they don't do like this one. That one actually caught two at once. Did you notice that? They're messy eaters. So seagulls and scavengers pick up what they drop. And of course, <laughs> that answers the question about the bear in the woods. <laughs> what a fantastic piece of video. A bear turning salmon into forest, just like Rudy Mankey would say. Um, but Streams with salmon and bear have a higher abundance of fruiting plants like the salmon berries and the devil's club that were just up there. And they have a, a higher abundance diversity of songbirds even along those streams. Higher productivity because a lot of nitrogen is getting out of the stream and deposited in those wonderful little bear cakes on the stream bank. And blowflies will come to that and they'll feed on the feces and they'll take them off in the forest. They'll get eaten by a bird and the bird will fly up to the top of the mountain and he'll do the same thing. And that cycle runs its way all the way to the peaks of the mountains. Yeah? Wonderful thing. I mean, just awe-inspiring. And the bear is a critical link in that. And, okay, how am I going to get all the way back to the, well, we had the whale in the beginning, right? Disruption in the Pacific ecology by the removal of one of the biggest carnivores in the, in the, um, the Pacific caused a ripple effect all the way down that affects herring. When salmon come in to spawn, one of the things that they primarily feed on is herring. If you go fishing in the Pacific, you're going to use herring for bait to try and catch salmon. And so reduction in herring can lead to a reduction in salmon, and a reduction of salmon in the streams means that trees don't grow as fast. And that's been shown experimentally. Trees in um, the Pacific Northwest in Alaska, southern Alaska, were shown that it was shown that uh, Sitka spruce, when either bears or salmon were removed from the stream, it takes about 230 years to grow a tall Sitka spruce. When bears and salmon are in the stream and the nitrogen is coming out of the stream the way it should, 86 years on average to grow a tall, mature Sitka spruce. And you know what? This feeds right back into the stream. Because one of the few trees in that Pacific Northwest that falls down a lot in these straight running streams to the coast is Sitka spruce. When they fall into the stream, they create structure. And they're creating structure that provides habitat for baby salmon. Is that not a wonderful story? <laughs> so you can tell all your friends. I don't know if I can tell you. But when a, whale, when a whale dies, a tree grows slower. I'm not sure I believe the guy, but uh, who cares? Who cares about salmon? That's the question. I ask researchers this at our seminars a lot of times in the department. Uh, why do I care about your research? You should be able to answer that question. Any of the students in here today, if you can't answer that question, you are doomed. <laughs> Make sure you know how your research impacts people's everyday lives. Who cares? We should all care. Those salmon, how many people are in here on a heart-healthy diet and eat some salmon every week? Because I do, right? Matter of fact, there's $394 million of wild salmon that's put onto U.S. tables every year. 47% of all the jobs in Alaska are tied to fishing, many of those to the salmon industry. And 162 to $540 million a year um, it's highly variable because the population of salmon is variable, but a huge number of wild salmon inject money into the economy of Alaska in the U.S. every year. Forty to fifty million dollars on average in British Columbia every year. 
But look at this, $288 million a year industry in British Columbia alone for sport fishing. 7,700 jobs in sport fishing. You know what? I was with one of those sport fishermen not too long ago, Roy Corneau, and he did an interview with me that I used a chunk of in, the, uh, in my expedition on this. And uh, he started off by saying, you know, what I want to know is back in, in the, the old, old days, days. I have to say the old days, like 1999, 1998, um, we used to be able to go out and get our limit of salmon in a couple of hours. And now it can take two or three days to get your limit. Uh, we're quite concerned um, because, uh, you know, where are the salmon going for one thing? Um, you know, what different habits are they forming and uh, what's happening with our rivers? 19, old days, I mean 1998, 1999. <laughs> Something's going on with salmon. Well, this concept, the keystone species concept, you know, I always like to bring it home. It's important, British Columbia important to us because we like salmon, but we can bring this right back here to our own backyard, right back to the, to the Carolinas and our watersheds here. Have any of you guys ever seen this phenomenon? One of my favorite things when I was growing up. You go out to the streams, small stream, any stream in this part of the world, in the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains of the Piedmont, in the spring, late April, early May, and you'll find these big masses of bright red fish, red or yellow. Each stream has a different species. And all these fish are gathered here in this mass, different species, breeding over the nest of that. That's the keystone. That's the species that's making the habitat and doing what needs to be done for all of these minnows in the stream to breed. That's a bluehead chub, and it ain't the prettiest thing. We used to call them horny heads when we were fishing when I was a kid because they get those tubercles up on their head, a little funky thing, but they are the reason these fish are here. Why? All of these chubs, central stone rollers, river chubs, uh, bluehead chubs, big mouth chubs, they all breed and build nests, pebbles, that they'll pile up in the stream into a big mound. It provides a great habitat for them to breed in. It provides a great habitat for all the other little minnows to breed in, too. All the things that we just looked at, these beautiful bright red things, will gather on these nests and lay their eggs because it's a silt-free environment, has high oxygen, it's got exactly what they need, but it's been experimentally shown that that's not the only reason. Bluehead chub is bigger than the minnow, but a bluehead chub eats things off the bottom. It feeds on that biofilm. It doesn't feed on minnows, so it doesn't eat the minnow. But it's big enough to chase away sunfish, rock bass, smallmouth bass, things that might come in and try to eat the eggs or eat the fry that hatch. So you know, those minnows are getting a great place to dump off their babies, and they're getting free childcare. <laughs> and it's been experimentally shown that that actually happens and that these, <laughs> these minnows are deriving a benefit from laying their eggs over the chub nest. That means, and this is the case in, in our small streams here, almost all of our minnow species breed over chub nests. Not all of them, some breed in crevices, but most of them breed over chub nests. That's pretty cool. If we lose the chubs though, we lose the minnows. You know what happens if you lose the minnows? You lose the things that eat the minnows. And you know what likes to eat the things that eat the minnows? We do. We like to catch them anyway. I'm not sure I eat them uh, but anymore, but <laughs> we like to catch them, things like bass uh, that eat these minnows. So they're tied directly to our life. And it's just an incredible thing to see um, that we have the same process as keystones here in these watersheds. And it's also important to remember that in British Columbia, what happens in the watershed is going to affect the salmon. Here, what happens to the watershed is going to affect the bluehead chub, which is going to affect the bass tournament on Lake Hartwell, which is going to impact the economy of Anderson County. And who's the biggest polluter, by the way? Savannah River Drainage. You guys know what company is the biggest polluter? Everybody in here, raise your hand. Because you are. <laughs> we are. More toxins and pollution enters our watersheds from our backyards, our driveways, and our homes than anywhere else. Well, yeah, this is amazing. If you guys have not seen this phenomenon, you need to go out in the spring to any small stream and just walk 10, 20 feet, and you'll find one of these chub nests full of these, these animals that live there. But what's also amazing to me is that in watersheds, watersheds, river drainages, act like islands. And for people who like to study speciation or like to, to look at things that have adapted very strangely, like in the Galapagos Islands, you don't have to go to the Galapagos Islands. You can go right here, find a watershed, and go to the next watershed, and you'll find completely different fish species. 
When you go up to highlands and you pass over the ridge, the continental divide, and you go from the Atlantic drainage, the Savannah River drainage, into the Kulasaja drainage, you're going to find a completely different set of fish on one side than you find on the other. A lot of times they're related. These little bright red fish that we're talking about are Natropus. They're shiners in the genus Hydroflox. It's fancy, but just remember, they're, Hydroflox means water flower, so they're flashy. They're like flowers in the water. And these are two examples. This watershed separates out the, uh, um, really, it's Lake Jocassi, but let's pretend like it separates out the Tennessee River drainage from the New River drainage. In the New, we have red lip shiners. In the Tennessee, we have saffron shiners. They're very closely related species. In fact, they're so closely related, when we bring them together in captivity, we can make mutts. They'll breed together, and they produce fully viable young, but they look very different, they act very different, and in the wild, they'll choose not to breed with each other most of the time. They function as species but they obviously share enough genes in common that we assume they have a common ancestor. So every time a new watershed happens, or every time a fish gets caught up in another watershed, there are ways to do that, like stream capture, the population that gets separated is subject to different environmental conditions, just like the salmon were subject to different environmental conditions with their eggs, and you develop just beautiful races of fish. This is the one we have right here. Check that out. Yellowfin shiner. You know where that was? That was taken at Lake, by, by Lake Issaquina in Wildcat Creek. You don't have to go far to see a spectacle, my friends. You can see it right here in your own backyard. Um, just absolutely amazing. Only one thing, and I am going to let it run, even though I know I'm talking too much. Um, when you find these, a lot of times also you'll find these, because they like to eat those. Um, Northern water snake. They're harmless snakes. Just enjoy them when you see them out there. But they do. That one has a pretty fat belly. I'm going to take a sip of water, and I'm just going to let you look at um, some fish from the new river drainage. It's where I grew up. And um, again, bluehead chub's the keystone. Check that out. <laughs> Who knew we had things this beautiful, this colorful in our own watersheds? This is one of the reasons why I'm proud to do a television show that originates in South Carolina and North Carolina, because people elsewhere in the world, they don't know we have this. They don't know that things just as beautiful as what you see on the Great Barrier Reef occur right here in our own streams. And what surprises me more is we don't know. If you were to tell people that there's a site like this in every stream in our area, they'd think you were crazy. So take them out. Let them experience it. That's the point. Well, we go elsewhere on our show. Obviously, we went to British Columbia. Um, we go outside the Carolinas, but we always make a point. I'm always making a point that what happens elsewhere in the world affects us here at home. So let's go to Chile. We're going to go down here to the 10th region of Chile, by Chiloé Island down here um, on the Mayin River, which is in South Chile. All the way on the other side of the world. Who cares about the other side of the world? Why should we care about the other side of the world? I mean, look at this place. Does that look like it has anything to do with South Carolina? Huge, giant trees found nowhere else in the world. Strange frogs. Look at those ibis, a volcano, monkey puzzle nut trees, Keltaways, white orchids, big green lizards, nice red flower, uh, swans with pink feet, black heads, gold toads, uh, strange giant woodpeckers, Darwin's frogs, this crazy thing. I still don't know what it is. And penguins? Come on. Penguins? What could this have to do with South Carolina? Penguins! I would have said the same thing, but I got a chance to go up the Mayin River, up to the estuary, all the way in southern Chile. And you know what crazy things I saw when I was up there? Shorebirds. Has anybody ever seen a bird that looks like that? Hopefully you've seen that one, because it's very common in South Carolina. Uh, they have the same type of shorebirds in Chile, but you know what? They don't just have the same type of shorebirds. They have the same shorebirds in Chile that we have in South Carolina. By the same, I mean the uh, exact same one. Shorebirds are the all-time great migrants in the, in the uh, bird kingdom. A lot of these birds will make a migration that is six, 8,000 miles one way, and they spend their entire life in spring. They're here on the coast and even on Lake Hartwell's shores here in the springtime, and they make their way all the way up to the Arctic to breed and go back. These are red knots that we saw when we were down in, in Patagonia. And the amazing thing there is that red knots are the extreme end of that migration. This is out at Harbor Island um, in Beaufort County, South Carolina. So we've switched from Patagonia to here. And what I'm going to show you here is a group of red knots that we, we filmed at, at Harbor Island in South Carolina. And there are two red knots here. 
one of them down here somewhere, there he is. He's got a red tag on his leg and this one has a red tag on his leg. And those red tags mean that they were banded in Patagonia, Chile. And they traveled 10,000 miles, 6,000 miles to here, 10,000 miles total, all the way to the very top of the landmass of the world, to Ellesmere Island, is where those two birds ended up this summer to breed. Imagine that. Not just them, but nine species that I counted there on my visit depend on the Mauyan River in the wintertime. And uh, that river's water quality is why the birds are there, and that water starts in the mountains. Without a healthy forest, you don't have healthy water that enters that estuary. And without a healthy estuary, you don't have those birds that we don't think of as Chile's birds. We think of those birds. Those are our birds. When I see them in Port Royal Sound, them suckers is mine. But they belong to the world. Who would have guessed that a place that far away could have so much to do? So, Right now, this part of Chile is being deforested at an enormous rate. It's losing forest incredibly. Uh, the Valdivian rainforest is one of the most imperiled regions of the earth, and it's a biological hotspot. Should we care? If you like to see those birds here, and one thing I like about birds, I used to not like them, but I like them now. Everybody likes birds, so I got to like them. <laughs> People care about them, and if you care about those birds, you better care about what happens to the forests down in Chile. There's still places like this in Chile. It's unbelievable. And I just still can't believe that a place like that is tied right back to our lives. Not only the birds, but uh, salmon. This is an area so far south in Chile, 41 degrees latitude there at the Mauyan River. That's about the latitude of Connecticut or uh, Oregon. And um, it has a climate very similar to the Pacific Northwest. So what we see everywhere when you fly the coast of Chile are all these lines of baskets and big containers and strings that have rope on them that are farming salmon mussels and oyster. And they farm so many salmon that I bet if you've eaten salmon in the past two weeks, it came from Chile. If it was farm raised, it probably came from Chile. As of 2002, they were producing more than 1.2 billion US dollars in salmon a year. Fantastic, huh? But the so water quality there is tied to the quality of the salmon that we get here. But salmon are in trouble in a lot of places. Wild salmon are in trouble. So let's go back just to, for a minute here to British Columbia and look at what's happened to salmon in one place that I had the opportunity to visit here. Um, these lines basically put them together. They represent um, what's happened to salmon populations since records started to be kept. There weren't a lot of people fishing in 1880 but there were a lot of people fishing in the 1960s and 70s, and you can see salmon populations were high. These are the ones they caught. These are the ones that escaped catching. And even up through 1900s, uh, 1990s, there were still a lot of salmon in the stream. And then all of a sudden, in the mid-1900s, we went from having one of the largest salmon fisheries in the world, one of the largest sockeye salmon fisheries in the world, to having one of the smallest, nearly absent, salmon fisheries in the world. So what's going on with salmon? We had the sea lion story, herring, to blame there. Is it all herring? No. Is there stuff going on in the ocean? Partly. But to really understand what's going on with salmon, you have to understand what's going on in the watershed. This is Rivers Inlet. And this is the watershed um, that that graph came from. And it gets its start way up here on the Silverthorn Glacier. To really understand what's going on with salmon, turns out we have to go all the way up there. OK, I have a really tough job. I got to fly up the river's inlet drainage over Okina Lake to an unbelievable area. That wasn't the funnest thing to do. I can tell you that. Flying sideways up a gorge, not too fun. But I got to see some things that nobody gets to see, places you just can't walk to, you can't get to, um, scenery that's unbelievable. But here it is. This is the Silverthorn Glacier. What I want you to notice here is that looks like a moonscape. There's nothing growing below the glacier there. But in just a second here, uh, we're going to see something. There's the ice. Melting ice provides the water that provides the head to the Wanuk River, the stream that feeds to Oakino Lake that goes out to the sea that the salmon, the sockeye salmon, primarily use for breeding. And when we flew over this glacier, the first glacier, by the way, I've ever had the opportunity to fly over in a helicopter, it was incredible. Incredible scenery, but what I was struck by most was the fact that this glacier was absolutely filled with pockmarks bigger than homes. Those gouges that you see in the ice there, we could have easily flown the helicopter into. And they're what's called mulas. They're where water is flowing from the glacier to the bottom of the glacier and then coming out the bottom of the glacier. And when that happens, that's it. 
glacier's done for. This is one of the largest glaciers in British Columbia, and it's also one of the most rapidly disappearing glaciers in British Columbia. We had summers that were so hot for three years in a row that water was able to eat its way down to the bottom of the glacier. And when you get water under a glacier, it lubricates it. It starts to slip downhill to where it's so warm that it melts very, very rapidly. And that's happening here. All that barren area that we saw below the glacier, it's not barren because this is at such high elevation. The base of this glacier is only about 7,000, well, no, I'm sorry, the base of this glacier is only about 3,000 feet. It's only 7,500 feet up here. And you can see there are trees growing above where the glacier is here. It's not above tree line. It's barren because all that land that I just showed you was exposed in 2007. That was glacier, 200 feet deep glacier in 2007. Um, it's, it's leaving and retreating so fast that this beautiful waterfall here, if you go to Google Earth, and I think the Google Earth image is five years old, you cannot find that waterfall on Google Earth. All you find is a mass of ice. It's retreating very, very rapidly, and it's adding a lot of water into the stream. Now, where glaciers retreat, they're colonized very quickly by plants. I didn't know this, but this is Sitka, uh, Sitka Alder, and this is an area where the glacier, this is the glacial line five years ago. Today, the glacial line is hundreds of feet upstream. And just in that five-year period of time, you have a nice little shrubland of uh, alders that is filled in below where the glacier was. So it doesn't take long. Well, that can cause problems with salmon, changing the habitat. And there's other things that are degrading water quality. Loss of pines, millions of acres out west. Anybody who's been to Rocky Mountain National Park or anywhere out west or western Canada has seen just mile after mile of dead pine trees. Pine beetle kills. The pine beetles, it's been so warm in the wintertime the past couple of years that it hasn't killed the pine beetles. And so the pine beetles have started to kill the pines. It's a native bug, but it's escaped what used to keep it in check, which was cold winter temperatures. Luckily, this one seems to be pretty cold. So we may put a damper on the pine beetle death. That could be partly to blame. But also logging. When you log an area like this, all the way down to the edge of the water, not good. Buffers are good if you're going to do logging. And logging in BC has proceeded at 50% over the rate of regrowth. So you've got siltation into the river coming from logging, coming from the melting of the glacier. And this is what the river, the Wanuck River, looks like. It's just a silted mess. And when it dumps into Oakino Lake, it turns the lake cloudy. So much water is entering Oakino Lake that the sunlight can't penetrate the silt that's being deposited by the glacial melt. And that silt goes all the way out to what you just saw there, the estuary, because the sun can't penetrate it to grow phytoplankton, grow the little plants that are the basis of the food chain. And when salmon are growing up, they need food. You may not know that, but when you eat fish, you need food. So we're producing less salmon in the lake, or smaller salmon in the lake. And then when they go out to sea to adapt to the in the estuary to adapt to the salt water, they're entering, entering a habitat that's also flushed with all this water that's coming off the glacier that's fresh, and there's no food in it. So we think that one of the main reasons for decline in these salmon is coming from the fact that that glacier, the Silverthorne Glacier, is dumping so much water because it's melting so rapidly into these streams. And how's that going to affect us? Got to remember <laughs> how many millions of dollars of salmon are in 288 just in sport fishery. And this is why. My friend Roy Corneau is wondering what happened to the watersheds, what's happening to the salmon. It's interesting, when you bring up climate change, it's very controversial. But if you go up there, I was fortunate enough to spend some time with the trapper. You may not be familiar with this, but trappers are not the most liberal thinking people on the planet. <laughs> they kill things for a living, OK? Their way of life is completely changing. Gene Allen, he's a wonderful guy. I mean, just one of the salt of the earth, unbelievably great gentleman. And uh, he was complaining to me that life has changed for him. The glacier's disappearing. But also what he was complaining about is it's just not right when I go out trapping in the wintertime. It's only 18, 19 below zero. It never gets 40 below zero anymore. What's going on? I said, Gene, I'd be thankful. <laughs> 40 below, come on. He's a tough man. Um, but I see him everywhere. I'm fortunate to go uh, around the world, and everywhere you go in the world today, something is really strange with the weather. Whether it's too hot, whether it's too cold, whether it's too wet, whether it's too dry, even in the desert, we know climate changes. You know, that's not controversial, right? If we're not sitting here pointing fingers, playing the blame game, being elitist, being authoritarian, but actually going out and saying, climate's changing, how many of you saw a woolly mammoth on your ride here tonight? No? No, thank climate change, OK? Climate changes. Difference is, 
we have to adapt to it because we depend on this earth for what we eat, what we wear, where we go, what we do, and we better care about adapting to climate change. So I think we can all bridge that gap, and we'll let the people who still think CO2 is very important, it can't hurt to reduce CO2, right? But we all have to adapt to it, we all have to live with it. And the Bush administration, the USGS under the Bush administration, in case you're not familiar with this, the breaking news, there weren't, they weren't exactly the most liberal organization administration either. But the USGS under the Bush administration put forth a report that said that Joshua trees would be absent, pushed out of Joshua Tree National Park probably within the next 50 years. Unbelievable things. It's happened before. It happened at the end of the Ice Age, so what's the big deal? What's changed? We've changed. We've dissected the habitat up to the point that things can't migrate anymore. Uh, we have so many Walmart parking lots and so many subdivisions and so many areas that no longer have continuous forest routes that things can't move. We have to be responsible for moving them. We have to be responsible for identifying places that are resilient to that change so that we can continue to have things like Joshua trees. Joshua trees doomed without our help, by the way, because they are spread around. The seeds, big seeds they have, are spread around by Shasta ground sloths. Giant ground sloths that went extinct somewhere around 10, 12,000 years ago. So they can't move far at all because nothing consumes those seeds and moves them. I have a lucky job and I get to see a lot of things, but sometimes when you're doing this, you get to be present at something you never ever want to see. For instance, the extinction of a race of species. Pika. Um, this is a little rabbit relative. It's not exactly a rabbit, but it's very closely related to rabbits. And it's found above tree line in alpine zones all over the western US, all over the northern hemisphere, Europe too. But pika here, um, are neat because they are rabbits. Rabbits cool off with their ears. That's why rabbits have big ears. We don't have any rabbits in the eastern US that have ears quite as big as the, as the black-tailed jackrabbit, but this guy lives in a desert. They have lots of blood vessels in the ear and that's how they shed heat. So those big ears are great radiators. If you're gonna live in a place that's 104, 106 degrees every day, you need big ears like that. How hot do you think it is where the pika lives? Not very hot. He lives in alpine and arctic tundra, so he needs really short ears covered with fur so he doesn't lose heat. Uh, they're so well adapted to that cold climate that they will overheat at 77 degrees and die. At 72 degrees, they'll overheat if they have to go walking to try and find food. And they're fascinating little animals. 200 words in their vocabulary. They have 200 different sounds they make. They collect hay and they store it for the winter. Little farmers, little grazers, ecosystem engineers that store hay so that they can eat in the wintertime because they're one of the few animals at that altitude that doesn't hibernate. And when I went out to the White Mountains of California, my colleague Tim Spira says, when you go out to the White Mountains of California, you need to go up there to the White Mountain Station. There's pika everywhere. The year before there were, but the year we went there was the year that pika disappeared. 36% of all the populations of pika found in the Great Basin Mountains have disappeared in the last decade. 36% of all the populations, each one isolated on a different mountain range. Each one stuck there in that alpine zone for 18,000 years. Something has been so screwy with the weather in the last five to 10 years that it caused the extinction of 36% of all the races of pika. That's irrefutable. There's no people living up there. There's no disease in these pika. These pika are dying of heat exhaustion. That's not just there, guys. Things are funky with the weather here too, right? We've never had a drought like this. Um, we've had all that rain the past couple weeks. The lake's coming up. The drought is not over. It could rain like this for six months. And we probably still have a deficit over the last 10 to 15 years anyway. I live on Lake Hartwell. My property's worthless. <laughs> we have to adapt. And one of the things about um, communication and bridging the gap that's what I love to do is bridge the gap, is if we can get beyond the controversy and focus on what's important, we can bring the most disparate groups in the world together to achieve a common goal. But look at what we're doing here. 
We have no water. We found out this past summer, if you lived in Anderson, where I do, when they told us the school's going to be out of water in three or four months, we found out how precious water is. It's more important than oil. It's more valuable than oil. There's lots of places in the world where people value water over oil. And what do we do? We have yards that are humongous that we need to water, and we plant hostas around our house. Just throwing it in the face of the people in Syria and Lebanon and Israel that, that fight for water. We use 100 gallons per person per day on average across the Carolinas. A 5,000 square foot lawn, which is the average size for Cary, North Carolina. Cary is an up. You guys may not go Cary. I used to live in Apex right by Cary. Uh, it's very affluent. But Cary uh, also, it, it's an acronym. It's not actually a real city name. They made it up when the Research Triangle Park came. It's the Centralized Area for Relocated Yankees. <laughs> and um, Cary, my friend Gary G Grabo up at NC State, founds that in Cary that you'll use 2,300 gallons per week, which is 30,000 gallons over June, July, and August on average. There's 1,975,000 homes in South Carolina right now. Do the math. We're using a lot of drinkable water, <laughs> and we're flushing it down the drain. Beaufort County alone, I think this is a, is a crime. 17 to 18 million gallons a day of potable water is dumped on landscapes and golf courses in Beaufort County every single day. Well, we've had a cool story. What did we really talk about, though? You know, my mode of communication is to get beyond the divisiveness and shoot right into what is so cool. It's the awe and it's the wonder that I feel that I want you to feel so that we can both be inquisitive together. And we can come to an agreement that regardless of what we think about creationism, regardless of what we think about what's causing global warming, we all have to work together to find solutions for problems that are hitting us right square in the face and right square in the pocketbook. Right? So what did we talk about? We talked about ecological interconnections, how every place on this planet has a connection to South Carolina, so we should care about the whole thing, even grizzly bears. Even the $3 million that was spent to understand grizzly bear genetics might be important. We talked about climate change, um, very sensitive topic, but you know, it's reality. It's always happened, it always will happen. We have to adapt to it, we have to find ways to alleviate it, we have to work together to do that. And we talked about evolution and speciation. And that may be the most sensitive topic, and I think that's the one that scientists has, have failed more than anything else to communicate effectively to the public and to give and take on both sides. We know that we cannot conserve biodiversity and populations without protecting the evolutionary process. Those fish in those streams, those salmon in those streams are not going to just stop adapting to their environment whether or not you believe that it happens. It's going to go on. And if we don't respect that process that's out there, regardless of where you think we came from, regardless of where you think the fish species came from, every population on this planet is changing all the time. We're changing. If we don't respect that, we can't preserve it. We're the biggest part of nature. And um, that's <laughs> one of the main points. There is no nature. There's the world. We're part of it. We're the greatest force working on the planet right now. And I think everyone will agree, with great power should come great responsibility and great accountability for all of us, every one of us. How important are you? How long will you be remembered? How many of you remember your great, 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 great grandfather's name? Most of us won't be remembered that way. But how long does the world remember? Last example I'll leave you with, and I promise I'll shut up. Imagine you want to do a television show. So you go to a producer and you say, I got a great idea for a show. What's it about? Sugar maples. I did that. And somehow Tom was so silly, he'd believe me. And we went ahead and we did it. And ETV liked it. It was awesome. Sugar maples. But sugar maples in Charleston. When you think about Charleston, you don't think about sugar maples, right? It's on the Canadian flag. It's found in the mountains. It's found in the Piedmont. It's not found in the low country. Live oaks, uh, palmetto trees, junipers, those are found down there, evergreen things. Sugar maples, not so much. But we find sugar maples associated with these gigantic piles of shell, some of them in rings, some of them in complex rings, piled one on top of the others, others just in mounds. What are those things? How did they get there? 
How were they built? Those are shell rings and shell mounds. It's one of the true treasures in South Carolina. We have more of them in South Carolina than anywhere else, the ring type, and larger ones. This one is called Fig Island because the people in Charleston didn't like the original name, Pig Island. You can't name something pig in Charleston County. Doesn't fly down there. Not saying anything about elitism, but this one, 150 meters long, 50 meters wide, and up to 30 feet tall. Millions and millions of oyster shells in this mound, all put there by people. Some of the largest man-made objects from the late archaic period. We date these sites to 3,000 to 5,000 years ago. And the simple act, all they are is garbage piles. The simple act of taking a shell and dumping it out in the trash in a pile changed the entire ecology of the South Carolina coastal plain. 5,000 years ago, you threw out trash. Today, sugar maples grow there, and it's the only reason. That's powerful stuff. The reason for it is because the shell mounds are composed of shell. Shell has lime in it. Lime raises the pH of the soil, makes nutrients more available for plants. If you've ever sent soil into the Clemson Soil Lab and you don't live in a very strange area for South Carolina or a shell mound, they tell you to add what to your lawn? Lime. Add lime to the lawn to make it better. Well, when you have lime around, you can have deciduous trees because deciduous trees dump away all their nutrients, all their calcium, non-mobile element at the end of the year. That's why they're deciduous. They're living in a rich neighborhood. I grew up in the Evergreen neighborhood. These guys are in the Paris Hilton neighborhood. They throw away their dress after they're done with it. And they do that because those shell mounds are made of calcium, and that's a very, very rare thing in South Carolina. Most of our soils are highly acidic. So we find sugar maples there where they shouldn't be. We find plants that can be found nowhere else, like Godfrey Swamp Privet on shell mounds in the only place in the Carolinas we can find them. And otherwise, it's a very rare plant on limestone sinks in Florida. We find this thing, shell midden morning glory. That should tell you something about it. A huge morning glory, only associated with these shell sites and some old home sites in South Carolina. Tubers this big, and it's a sweet potato. It's edible. It was taken there most likely by people. And we even find trillium. Way out there, coastal islands, middle of the salt marsh, we find a spring flowering ephemeral, Trillium maculatum out there. It's spread about by ants, and we have no clue how they got to these shell mounds. But what we do know is that the simple act of people that died 5,000 years ago is the reason they're able to grow there today. This is why we have to bridge this gap. This is why we have to start communicating. It's why scientists need to start talking to people other than scientists, and people from outside need to be interested in what the scientist is doing. Because think about the impact of what we do. Think about the impact of what you've built, what you've done, the act of driving here. How much greater a use of resource, how much greater a dumping have you done out there into the world than these people? And this is the impact of theirs. You know what's interesting? That impact. It wasn't all bad. I mean, that's why Trillium is growing there. It's not all doom and gloom, guys. I can tell you that. The world may be in bad shape, but it always has been. And there are some very amazing, compelling stories of hope out there. This was out in <laughs> Southern California, believe it or not. Uh, just a few years ago, we had no, first, no uh, elephant seals breeding on the beaches of, of mainland California. Now we have at least two huge colonies. And there must have been 2,000 big male and juvenile males gigantic things the size of a school bus out there on this beach. They were reduced just to a handful of pairs, and we thought they were extinct 100 years ago. And you know what? When I can go to Big Sur, California, and see condors flying in the wild again, up and down the coast of California, I have hope. I have hope that we can bridge the gaps, and I have, have hope that we can communicate and learn to find common ground enough that we can keep the biodiversity on this planet that all of us depend on around for my children, for your children, for your grandchildren. And 5,000 years from now, people will look back and they'll say that the impact that we had here in South Carolina on the planet was just as positive as the impact that those Native Americans had 5,000 years ago. Thank you very much. And I have, some, um, I have to give some credits, because there's, there's no way you can do this alone. Uh, the producers uh, of the show that uh, Photo and video guys who are all up here, Josh uh, Gilliatt, uh, me, <laughs> Ed Pavorn, and Scott Smith, and David White shot all the video that you saw in the stills. Uh, Matt Johnson also did. And uh, this is a disclaimer, don't try this at home.
And I want to give special thanks. We would not have possibly been able to bring you the story that we had tonight, or the story that you'll see on expeditions on the Great Bear Rainforest and the Valdivian Rainforest of Chile, if it wasn't for a fantastic partnership with um, Rick and Deb Fisher and the Cliffs International, and uh, all, of their, uh, all of their staff that were so helpful in not just putting us out there in nature, but putting us in, putting us in touch with some fairly amazing people uh, at universities in Chile, researchers and Native Americans in British Columbia who are working very, very tirelessly and hard to protect the resources there in a way that I, I hope we can work here. Thank you very much, and I would like to thank my family most of all. Okay, I understand that uh, we have a uh, group of folks that are going to sit down with me and talk. If, if, if I could have two of my folks come up and talk with me. Any two? <laughs> Any two. How about you, Pat Zungoli? <laughs> well, I guess I have a question for you. You have everybody eating out of the palm of your hands now. Do you have an assignment for your audience? Yes, get interested, <laughs> get outside, <laughs> experience. The, the, the best thing we can do for this planet, in my opinion, the best thing we can do to solve uh, many, many of our problems is to get your kids, get your grandkids, and get them outdoors. Get them outside, get the connection back, get the feeling that you had when you were a kid back for what's going on outside, what's going on outside your door, away from your laptop, and away from your Blackberry. Yeah. Are you familiar with Richard Lu Richard Lou's oh, book? Oh yes, of absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Can you relate Last a little child bit? in the woods. Yes, yeah. Sure. Um, I well, I definitely believe in what Richard Lou uh, preaches. I think that uh, that a lot of our problems in society and a lot of our problems, physical and mental, that we have in society, definitely come from our nature deficit disorder. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, th I think that says volumes, and I would encourage anybody if they want a good, great read to pick up that book yeah, by for, Richard Lee. For those of you who haven't read it, it is, um, it's a book about the impact of children who um, suffer from a variety of stresses. Um, some are ADD, and when they get out into the woods and they experience nature, they go through an amazing transformation. I, I can give you one really poignant example. Uh, I was invited down to the Delahoe School, which is down in McCormick County. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's a school for troubled kids. And they go to that school uh, to a, a camp. It's a wonderful thing called an environmental camp or ecology camp. It's a wilderness camp is what they call it. And I was able to go down there with them, take them on a tour of, of Stevens Creek. And we're talking about students that come out of the inner city of Charleston, Columbia, um, generally minorities. None of them been out in the woods before. And we had him out there for a few minutes, and here's this dopey-looking white nerdy guy taking these kids out in the woods. And let me tell you, within 15 minutes, those kids went through a transformation that was unparalleled in my existence. And <laughs> I, I would do anything for that school uh, and anything for those kids just from the transformation you saw by getting them out there and having the enthusiasm. It's the enthusiasm, you know? Without that, you're dead. Yeah. You're dead in the water. <laughs> and I had those kids at picking leaves in the Heritage Preserve, God help me, but picking leaves, um, <laughs> picking leaves and saying, now what is this for? What can you do with this? What can you do with that? How is this good? Because everything out there has a value, you know, has a value to people. And, and that was amazing, I think, to see and to see the great work that they do at the Delahoe School mm -hmm. in, in not just transforming some troubled kids' lives, but in creating leadership and leaders. Right. out of that school for yeah. South Carolina. And you know what? The outside has a lot to do with that. I've got a question. Um, something I've been thinking about for several years now, about the failure to communicate. Yeah. To a large extent, the policymakers and the politicians don't want to hear what's being communicated. Um, in, in some areas, uh, historically, the United States has been the gold standard in terms of environmental protection. For example, our national park system, over 100 years old, has been replicated all around the world. Mm -hmm. When you flash forward 100 years to what's going on now, 
when you get on issues of sustainability and global warming, the policymakers and the politicians in other countries are listening to the scientists and they're way ahead of us in coming up with solutions. And not that it's not happening in this country, but it's so far behind the other countries. And I've been unable to come up with an explanation of why there's this difference. Well, explanation's obvious. How much money can you stuff in my pocket? <laughs> this is, uh, you know, the, the thing that bothers me about this issue is that this isn't a, it's not a party issue. This is a survival issue, the climate, and what we can do about it. And one of the things that I've always found frustrating is that the way I was brought up, conservatism, the base word for that is conservation. Right. Okay? We don't like to squander money. Most conservative people don't squander money. Most conservative people are interested in their child's future. They're going to send them to great schools. They're going to, to, to raise them in the manner that they've been raised. They're, they're very conservative about that. Why not be conservative enough to realize that you're dooming your kid's future, you're dooming the economics of the United States if you don't embrace the fact that you have to be sustainable in the way that you, that you live, the way that you survive? This should be a conservative issue. Right? I agree when, people, totally. when people say that's a liberal issue, I, it, my ears start to burn because liberal means change, and we're talking about keeping something. Right. It's not change. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's an issue that I think will, you know, from a policy standpoint, I think will, uh, will harm the conservative parties in this country for, for, for a long time because we have failed to act on good information. We, failed, we, we haven't acted on any information. Uh, the United States, in my opinion, is behind Chile in what they're doing uh, to combat, and not just combat, to adapt. <laughs> we may not be able to do anything about climate change. I don't care if climate change is coming from sun activity or carbon dioxide, but it happens. And when weather patterns happen, you have to have a plan to deal with that. It's the conservative thing to do. We probably have time for one more question. Do you have another question for Patrick? Um, uh, have you? I've seen several of your episodes on your program. I don't know a lot about the other part of your life. Have you gone to Columbia, South Carolina, or to Washington, D.C., to talk to policymakers? Have you testified in hearings? Certainly. <laughs> okay. So um, tell us about it. <laughs> well, I've, I've uh, been active uh, talking to politicians. Um, and formerly, I was on, well, I still am uh, on the Heritage Trust Advisory. A natural Areas Advisory Committee. Um, but I prefer uh, to talk to people, mm -hmm. uh, to talk to the general population rather than talking to politicians, because I don't think politicians are going to listen to me any more than they would listen to you. But if I talk to enough of you and get you, and don't just tell you about things, and the important part is I'm not going to sit there and tell you with an authoritarian mindset that, you know what? This is going to damn this population of the, of the world. This is wrong. This is something you should do. Just why? Because I'm a scientist and I said so. I want to take you there. I want to show you what I see in my relationship with the natural world. And you're smart enough to make up your own mind. If I can just get you to love the thing and to be open-minded and learn about it, we're going to make the right decisions. And one guy like me going to Columbia and, and, and visiting with the governor and saying, hey, you might want to put more money into Clemson so that we can keep researchers like uh, Pat Zongoli and me around, <laughs> uh, is not going to hold a lot of weight. But if, if you guys do that, how much more amplified is that? And I'd much rather keep my voice less of an activist voice and a lot more of an enthusiasm and a, a promotion of that enthusiasm in the general public. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm delighted with the first night that we've had a Clemson for Clemson program, and I think it's going to be a good start. You've set a high benchmark, Patrick, and thank you very much. You're very, very welcome. Thank Drive you. Carefully. Thanks, Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Steve.